So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, my name is Spencer Allingham. Hello. Uh, I'm one of the senior solution architects at Peer Software. I'm joined today by my direct senior, uh, Pete Gard. Uh, Pete is the technical manager at Peer, working from our EMEA HQ in Germany. And he'll keep an eye on any questions as they come through. So feel free to use the Q&A box and keep him busy. <laughs> Today, we're going to take a high-level look at our peer GFS or peer global file service software and then take a deeper dive into its edge caching feature. Now, I often like to describe peer GFS as a Swiss army knife for distributed files environments. There are many things that you can do with it, but fundamentally, it's most often used to monitor storage locations in real time and synchronize files between them to keep each up to date. It includes file locking, which helps users work from being accidentally overwritten by a remote user, as well as malicious event detection to help stop the spread of ransomware. The file synchronization allows geographically distributed teams of users to safely collaborate on the same project files whilst enjoying the performance benefit of accessing the files locally, as opposed to a central file server or SAN across a WAN or VPN. This is great for user productivity, and when integrated with a standard DFS namespace, can also become part of a highly available disaster recovery strategy that keeps users actively working in the event of an outage. Peer GFS can also be used as a point-in-time backup solution that leverages the scalability and availability of object storage in public or private cloud. But let's start by answering this question. What is edge caching exactly? Let's use an example to explain it. Let's say we have a company that creates and produces content for the entertainment and media industry. They have a data center in London and another in Edinburgh. Now, this is great for the artists who live near Edinburgh or London, but some of the artists work from the smaller edge offices in Newcastle, Belfast, Birmingham and Cardiff. The artists at these smaller edge offices tend to focus on producing content for a particular client of the company. But what does this mean from a storage perspective? With Peer GFS, you could synchronize the entire company's data set between each of the locations. You would effectively have all files everywhere. Whenever a new file was created or modified, Peer GFS would immediately synchronize the file event with all of the other storage locations. From a user point of view, this is brilliant. The entire data set is available locally wherever that user is, and that gives the best user experience. From a business point of view, though, it means that each location has to have the necessary infrastructure and storage to host the entire data set. This could be expensive, especially if the edge locations only need to work with a subset of the main data set. And this is where edge caching helps. There is a, a very real trend for unstructured data to increase and sprawl across systems. In a lot of cases, it doesn't make sense for edge locations to be full of data when 80% of it is actually not needed by the users. So why store it there? Traditional vaulting or archiving solutions can impact performance and in some cases even lock the data away from the users. It certainly doesn't make sense to completely lock data away if that means you can't access it easily if you might need it at some point or if you want to run analytics or use it for machine learning. Edge caching means that the storage footprint and cost can be lessened whilst still providing a means of access just in case it's needed in the future. If the edge locations only need to work with a subset of the overall data set, edge caching can help reduce the storage space and infrastructure required, which in turn can reduce the cost of the storage footprint required. So, 
what does it look like to the users? Well, they get to see the entire data set, all of the files. However, some of the files will be cached at the edge location, meaning that the entire file is there for them to access locally. And some will be dehydrated stub files, which take up very little disk space on the edge server and which can be rehydrated on demand. Notice that the dehydrated files appear as offline files depicted by the gray cross on their file icon. Now, before we rehydrate one of them, let's compare the disk space usage on the first file called businessmeeting.jpg. Notice that the size of the file is 5.23 megabytes, but the size taken up on the disk is zero bytes. If we open the file by double clicking on it, it'll be rehydrated on demand, which involves replacing the dehydrated stub file on the edge server with a copy of the file from a master server. After that, the file exists locally and it will be opened as normal. If we close the file, we see that the little cross that is the offline indicator is gone and we have the actual file cached now locally. There are three main configurable components when deciding what should be cached at edge locations. The first is to choose how much space to give the cache on edge servers. You can choose a physical amount of storage space in gigabytes or terabytes, or use a percentage of a volume. Choosing a percentage is useful when the volume sizes differ between edge servers at different locations. You can be alerted when the disk space gets below a certain value or the cache exceeds, for example, 80% of the total cache size. It's useful to know if free space is getting tight before it becomes an issue. You can also choose a caching scan schedule to define when a caching scan is run to automatically hydrate or dehydrate files at the edge servers. Secondly, you can choose to stub or dehydrate files during a caching scan based on file size, when they were last modified or last accessed. Using the dynamic set of rules for the time period will ensure that the cache is well populated with the files that the users are currently working on or have been working on recently. Ensuring a well-populated cache will give the users the best experience by having as many of the relevant files cached locally as possible, thereby reducing the number of files that would need to be rehydrated on demand. Thirdly, you can set pinning filters to have certain files, file types, or even folders either stubbed at the edge locations or kept hydrated at the edge locations. So, what are the main benefits from using edge caching? The first, quite simply, is save money by increasing storage efficiency at the edge and centralizing backup across the enterprise while reducing administrative overhead. Cross-platform support allows you to choose on-premises or cloud storage technologies that are optimized for capacity and cost to further enhance the return on investment. This means your master servers hosting the full data set could be Windows servers, Dell EMC storage, Nutanix files, NetApp fabric attached storage, or a mixture of them. Edge servers would be Windows file servers or Windows file server VMs. Reduce risk. If you decide to stop using PeerGFS, there's nothing to migrate. All of your files are still accessible in the normal way. Of course, if you were using the edge caching, it would make sense to rehydrate the files at the edge first or give the edge users access to the central master servers, as otherwise you'd be left with the stub files at the edge, of course. But this is different from some other companies who would have you store all your files in their cloud so that they're only accessible via their caching server or cloud gateway. If you stopped using their gateway, you wouldn't have access to your files anymore. And that's not great if you're trying to maintain data sovereignty. 
Improve productivity for geographically distributed teams by enabling fast local access to shared project files. Help stop user complaints about slow file access across the WAN or VPN. Peer GFS uses real-time file locking to protect a user's current work from being accidentally overwritten by a remote user. Built-in malicious event detection technology helps to identify and prevent the spread of malicious actors such as ransomware. When you have a file synchronization technology operating in real time, this is very important. The last thing you want is for your chosen file sync solution to help ransomware spread around the various parts of your organization. Now, if you're thinking of deploying peer GFS and its edge caching technology, you would be in very good company. These are just a few of the thousands of customers peer software has around the world. We've been around since 1993 and have continually improved our technology. So it's easy to see why some of the world's leading organizations trust peer. Let's take a look at some scenarios where it would be a good idea to get in touch with Peer to discuss your use case and IT environment. The first is when you say, we need fast local access to globally shared data. Slow remote file access over a WAN just can't compete with the performance of fast local access to files. Peer GFS provides that whilst keeping each separate storage location current and up to date with file changes. Geographically dispersed teams of users can now safely collaborate on the same project files whilst enjoying the performance benefit of working locally. Edge caching, which has been the main focus of today's webinar, helps to fight back against exponential data growth. We all know that the number of files that we need to store is always increasing, as is the average file size. Peer GFS can help by reducing the storage footprint and cost at edge locations, whilst allowing users there to still have access to the entire data set. The files they are currently working with or have been working with recently can be cached locally, whilst the less relevant files can still easily be rehydrated on demand. Peer GFS is designed to work with your existing IT infrastructure. It's a software only solution, so there are no hardware appliances or gateways to purchase. And most importantly, all peer software comes with zero vendor lock in. We use open standards to store data in the normal way at each storage location. If you decided to stop using Peer GFS, as I mentioned, there's nothing to migrate. All of your data would still be accessible in the normal way on your master servers. Another reason to get in touch with a peer engineer is if you need real-time file synchronization between data centers. Now, this is great when implementing a DR strategy as each site is monitored in real time and contains a read-write continuous data protection copy of the files that can be highly available. When combined with a standard DFS namespace, if one site has an outage, the users would be automatically switched to another online copy so that they can continue working and stay productive. When the down site comes back online, Peer GFS would automatically resynchronize it with all of the changes that happened elsewhere in the meantime to bring it back up to date and would then inform the namespace so that the users could go back to working locally again. So you get automatic failover, automatic resynchronization, and automatic fail back. Another reason for calling Peer about data center sync is if you'd like high availability for your VDI infrastructure. It's often fairly straightforward to make VDI at a single site highly available and resilient. And 
Of course, it makes sense to do so given the cost of VDI downtime. But what if there's some disaster at the site that completely takes it out? PeerGFS provides multi-site high availability for VDI, replicating profiles when the user logs off and user file data in real time. Let us know if you, if you want more information on that. If you simply want to back up remote offices to a central HQ or data center, the real-time monitoring of each storage location to provide continuous data protection means that you would have a near zero RPO and RTO in the event of a disaster. You wouldn't need local IT expertise at each site to manage the backup as the whole thing could be managed centrally from the peer management center in the main data center. If you need a backup to tape style replacement that leverages the scalability and availability of public cloud, that's another good reason to get in touch with a peer engineer. In addition to the multi-site, multi-storage vendor synchronization that PeerGFS provides, you can also push versions of files to low cost object storage with or without scheduled snapshots for a point in time backup that's easy to restore from with a simple restore wizard. Files are stored as native objects, which means that if you wanted to use the data in the object store for cloud hosted analytics or reporting, you could do that as soon as the data arrives. And this is another benefit of Peer's no vendor lock-in policy. As you can see, most enterprise grade storage types are supported as a backup source and PeerGFS can replicate to Microsoft Azure Blob, Amazon AWS S3, NetApp Storage Grid, and Nutanix objects. In addition, most S3 compatible object storage can be used too, such as Dell ECS or Scality Ring. So to summarize, it would be a good idea to get in touch with Peer Software if you've ever said something like, hey, we need file collaboration across all offices, or we need quick and automatic failover and easy fail back between sites, or we need to back up remote or branch offices to the HQ, or we need highly available active active VDI across sites, or we need to sync different storage types from different vendors. As I mentioned before, Peer Software have been developing file replication and synchronization solutions for nearly 30 years now, and we are rather good at it. So please feel free to get in touch to tell us how we could help you and your organization. Um, here are the, the contact details of the EMEA offices. So I hope this session has been useful. Um, let's see if we've had any uh, questions come through. Uh, Pete, uh, can you unmute yourself and, and come in and tell me if there's any questions? Oh, sounds like Pete's having some problem with his uh, audio. Let's, uh, let's let's have a look here. So let's see. Um, hey, guys. <laughs> come on, Pete. Let's see. It looks like he's trying to get in. Pete, you there? No, I think Pete may be having some trouble with his audio. Okay. So. Uh, Any luck, Spence? Ah, yes. There we go. Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Bit of teething issues. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've, had a, we've had a few questions coming in from the panel. Um, the first one that came in was about what happens if the edge server goes down? Very good question. Uh, you know, so the edge server, which Spencer was speaking about, where obviously we're, we're caching on that edge location, if that is to fail, obviously, if that server goes down, it means the users can't work there. Those users then through the DFS namespace side of things can at least get pointed to another location because of the high availability in the solution. Um, they can then point to the master where all the data obviously is or another edge location. And then when the edge server comes back online, Peer will bring that data back up to date with all the changes that have been going on while it's been offline. It'll then obviously route the users back to the edge location. And then in the evening, we'll do something called a 
caching scan and then the most frequently accessed files will obviously then be rehydrated and those that aren't used will be dehydrated and pushed back to the master so that was a good one that came in spence uh, there was also some questions just around how it's licensed so i don't know if you want to take that one spence yeah certainly um now, as you can tell, I'm I'm just a lowly engineer, so I won't get into the the pricing side of things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, fundamentally, there are two parts to the licensing. The first is what we call a base license, and you would need one of those for each storage location, basically, that is to be uh, monitored in real time. The second part of the licensing is a capacity license, which is sold by the terabyte. So you would need enough terabytes to be able to monitor the data set that you want to keep synchronized between the locations. And we only count the data once. Um, so let's say you had three terabytes of data to be kept synchronized between three um, different locations. That would be a three terabyte license. You, you wouldn't have three at one location plus another three at the second location plus another three at the third location. It's simply a three terabyte license. Um, but uh, if you would like to discuss uh, more about licensing and, and pricing, the uh, the contact details are there. Get in touch with one of the commercial guys at, at your local office, and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, discuss that with you. Pete, um, hopefully that answered that one. Uh, are there any other questions that we have coming through? Yeah, Spence, if you want to take this one as well. So someone's had a question just around about how does how does the solution support SQL servers? So it sounds like database type of servers. Um, what about IIS servers as well as so application side of things? Is that included in the remit here? Okay, I would say that that's really a little bit out of scope. Um, it's not really for things like databases. It's more for... Um, user project files um, because it is asynchronous replication. So you wouldn't use it uh, for something that would need to have data um, kept synchronized in that way for something like a SQL database. It's not designed for that. It's designed for the sort of files that users would create and work with um, at a file level. Yep, awesome, Spence. And then the last one I've got here is about requirements just between sites. Um, yep. Is is a VPN required? Uh, how does how does that work? Okay, so um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a VPN between sites, but you would need some sort of network connection uh, between the sites in order to. I mean, there are many different types of of WAN that are, are, are available. It, it's not forcing you to use a VPN, but you do need some sort of network connection over which we can gather telemetry uh, from our peer agents that are doing the monitoring in real time, and so that we can synchronize files via SMB. Awesome. And then there's a really good one that's just, just popped in, um, around about cloud and hybrid cloud. Um, so we've got some interest just on the chat, really, about how PAGFS works with Azure, Spence, yep. um, how that sync sort of stands up, um, the storage side of things. Are you right just to just elaborate on that a little bit and how that works? Yeah, certainly. Um, so if you've... Um, I can see that question now. It's come through from Robert. Um, so... Yes, the you would need, um, uh, for example, if you wanted to run a, a Windows file server in Microsoft Azure, we would treat it just as another file server. You would then put uh, a peer agent software on that to monitor its storage in real time. Um, feedback to the central uh, peer management center, which would then orchestrate the synchronization of the changes from where they happened on that Azure hosted file server to your other office um, or offices. Um, and we can also synchronize between cloud regions as well. Some of our customers use it for that. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers that. If, if that hasn't answered it completely, Robert, then uh, please send us through a, a second question. So Pete, yep. do we have any other, any other questions that have come through? Um, the other ones, I'm just checking out. No, there hasn't really been much more. I mean, it it was a, a you know great presentation, Spence. Oh, um, <laughs> there's from from obviously our side. Um, the key. 
I'm just reading if there's any more guys. That's why I'm just pausing. But no, it's all, it all seems good. Back to you, Spence. All right, lovely. Well, um, I'll I'll wrap up here and uh, give give some of you a, a few minutes of time back. Um, sincerely, I hope this has been helpful. We're planning some more of these webinars uh, for after Christmas, so please feel free to come along uh, to those. Thank you very much, all of you, for your time and for the great questions. And have a very good rest of day. Thank you. Thanks, guys.